Well, good morning. It's great to be with you on this humid first day of summer. Well, I guess, at least first Sunday in June. I don't know if it's the first day of summer. But with the start of our time together in June, we decided to take some time and spend some time, as was mentioned before, in the book of Psalms, not through the book of Psalms. My, my father mentioned to me this morning, he said he had someone who came this morning and said, oh, I, I wonder how you're going to tackle Psalm 119. Um, we're going to be here till Christmas going through the Psalms. It's interesting that that individual mentioned that because I'll have the opportunity to teach today and then again in the month of August, and my psalm of choice is Psalm 119. So today will be Psalm 5. So if you have a Bible, would encourage you to take your Bible or the device by which you can access the Bible and turn to the book of Psalms. Chapter 5 will be our text this morning. And as you're turning there, we'd love to just say a few things by way of clarity. Uh, as you came in this morning, you had the opportunity to receive three free items. Does anyone like that four-letter word free? I sure do. You guys don't like free? All right, for you, it's 50 bucks. You know, no, I like it. Free, free. And this is what they are. We, we put together a small little reminder of God's grace and the importance of God's word. Now, my brother, we were somewhere this week, and someone said, what are all those tattoos? And, hey, this reminds me, this reminds me, this reminds me. I was like, man, that's awesome that he does that. I just, am, you know, I can't make that big of a commitment. I need a bracelet. You know, I could take it off or something. So, like, we make these bracelets, and this is what it says on it. Send your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Psalm 43.3. On the inside, it's the website of the church that you're sitting in at the moment or joining us online coastline Gulf breeze. I'm told that these glow in the dark, which is fun, but I haven't tested that yet. Um, but this is meant to be a reminder for you or an opportunity to reach someone this week with the love of Jesus. If you've been here before when we started a series, I've, I've shared about my friend Marco from Milan who moved to Destin the same time that I did. And he opened up a coffee shop. And, and Marco's not a professing Christian but he loves bracelets. So his arm, almost from wrist to elbow, is covered in bracelets from the time that I was in Destin. And they say so many different themes, like Jesus is better, or Jesus rebuilds and restores. Or, so every time I see Marco, Neil, I like those bracelets. Like, well, man, read them. Like, they, they, you know, believe them. But I'll have to give this one to Marco. But that's meant for you to take and to be reminded. Or to engage with someone who needs to experience new life in Jesus. The second thing you would have received this morning, if you so chose, was a little sticker. Can you read that sticker from where you're seated? Keep calm and read a psalm. I didn't come up with that, but whoever did, I think is great. Because the psalms, as we're going to learn about this morning, are so helpful. So helpful. They're like soul food if that makes any sense, right? You like soul food? I like it. I think it's great. But anyway, some people don't. The third thing, I would love to give you, at least for today's psalm, two things, two opportunities, two tools to put in your spiritual Batman belt or whatever that thing's called, utility belt. I have a friend that wrote a book called Praying Through the Tabernacle. Wonderful, powerful little read that if you struggle and getting work done in prayer, where you could stay focused for five minutes, 20 minutes, three hours. There is a way to do that, but tools help. Pastor John shares about the beauty of the meeting place that God had with his nation of Israel, and how each station has an opportunity for you to spend some time lingering in prayer. You say, what does that mean? Let me give you two examples. I'll actually quote a verse. Enter his courts with and his gates with praise. What if you entered through the gates of prayer in praise before expressing your problems? What if you started prayer in the language of praise and thanksgiving 
rather than, God, I'm freaked out. <laughs> when is that bridge going to go to two lanes? I'm thankful that it's one, but now I'm sitting in a bottleneck traffic. You know, what if you said, God, thank you that I'm alive. Thank you that you're good. But before I'm even going to thank you, I'm going to praise you. See, perspective is what is generally the difference maker in humans. Those that learn to EQ the IQ go far. Those that don't sit where they are. Your perspective matters. It matters greatly. Often it's the difference maker in the fruitfulness of your life. Perspective. Why do you think God gave you a tool to form your perspective daily? Because it matters. I would say, and maybe I'm wrong in this, it's one of the things that matters most. How you see it. So, and then lastly, on the other side, is lyrics. When, when I first was impacted by Psalm 5, it impacted me deeply. And as the pastor was sharing about it, I had these lyrics come to mind. So I wrote them down. And 16 or 15 years ago, I used to lead worship a lot. You know, if you work in a church and you can't play four chords for the Lord, you better learn, you know. Like you need to learn that guitar, you need to learn how to help kids or something. So for a while, I led worship often. I don't do so anymore, except for maybe in devotions with my kids. But there's a song that I, I guess, uh, really David wrote it, but I just put it in my language, called Morning by Morning. You know why I love this song? Because it puts Leonidas to sleep. That's why I like that song. Because I can put that song on there, and for some reason, whether the cadence or sound, or he listens to it and he goes, boom. And as a two-year-old wild man with lion-like hair, we love it when Leo goes to sleep. In fact, he ruined my date night last night because he wouldn't go to sleep. So I think I should have played that song. We had to take him. I won't tell you about last night's fiasco. But yeah, I could tell you about a lot. But I'm not going to share all that. Anyway, those are the three handouts you received this morning. Lord, I thank you for the time and opportunity we have to be together. Lord, as we journey through specific psalms this summer, as we have the opportunity to hear from special friends like Malcolm Wilde and Kent Nottingham and Jess McKernan and Pastor John Spencer. and Lord, I just pray that we would experience your peace through your Spirit's presence as we spend time in your Word. Lord, I, I would admit that I could do with your presence moment by moment. Lord, I pray that for me, you would teach me to wait upon your grace. Lord, that you would teach me to seek your face. Lord, that you would teach me to wait on your timing, not to push mine. And Lord, I pray that you would take my heart and make it more like yours. I know that's what I need. Although I don't have the opportunity, Lord, to know everyone that's in this room or the other rooms connected to us online or even those listening at a later time, Lord, I pray and ask that by your Spirit, hope, peace, joy, the gift and fruit of self-control would grow to a greater degree in our lives because of time spent in your word this morning. Please give me the ability to serve your people well by explaining the text and exposing, Lord, how you are truly the focus. Jesus, we love you. We're gathered to say thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the ability to sing and to learn and to serve and to give and to just be together today. We pray for our kids. Lord, that you would raise up a generation that loves you, that loves people. And God, that you would bless. 
Lord, we pray that in the only name that matters, the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, the name at which one day we'll all bow and confess lordship. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Psalm chapter 5 is our text for this morning. However, we will be in Psalms, Lord willing, for the months of June and July. So by way of preparation, clarity, perspective, I'd like to share a few things with you about Psalms in general. You know this thing right here, name. You know the name. What, what in the world does it mean? Is it a Kanye kid? Like, what is Psalms? Like, what is that about? Well, the Hebrew means praises. When the Bible was translated into the Greek Septuagint, the word meant a poem sung to musical, I don't know how to say this word, accompaniment? Yeah, accompaniment. That's, that's what this is. These are lyrics to tunes. This is the book of poetry given to the church. I think we could do with some modern day poets again. I think Christians should awaken to the power and the gift of words. And when you can remember them because they rhyme, well, that sounds good to me. And if they're put with the accompaniment of music, even better, even better. That's what the book of Psalms is. Purpose. Well, Psalms teach us to have a personal relationship with God. I'm going to ask this question by a sign of hands that are raised. How many of you would say you yourself, or at least you know someone, who you would say, you know what? I think they have a personal relationship with God. Is that you or do you know somebody? Okay, great. This is the purpose, is to teach you to tell him your hurts, to communicate your hang-ups, your needs, but not to linger there, to focus on the grandeur and the greatness and the glory of God, but be honest with God. It's very hard to get traction with someone until you're finally honest. Then the relationship begins. And one thing you'll see in the book of Psalms, these people got some bad ideas. Like David, break the teeth out of their mouth, Lord. Like, wow. Man after God's own heart. I guess that's what we should do today, right, guys? Like, Let's go get them. Well, I don't know. But there's honesty. In this collection of songs or poetry, you're going to find suffering, praise, confession of sin and faith, hymns, historical renditions of poetry. And whether the writer is looking back to history, up to the heavens, or looking around at his problems, he always ends by looking to the Lord in faith. You need to learn this skill set. You need to learn this. Yes, life is hard. Becoming a believer is not rainbows and roses. In fact, it gets harder. Because now you're a difference maker. Now you're someone that's not swimming in the tide of the enemy. You're you're swimming against the tide. Yes, it will get harder. So learn. You know, it's a personal, emotive, and relatable book. Ambrose, one of the great saints of the church, said, the Psalms are the voices of the church. Augustine said, they are the epitome of the whole scripture. Luther said, they are a little book. For all the saints. Remember that? Can you imagine? Like, and they got like a hundred and something chapters. Like, that's just a little book. Luther, man, that guy's crazy. John Calvin said, they are the anatomy of all parts of the soul. Man, I like that. That's a great description. Spurgeon said, the book of Psalms instructs us in the use of wings as well as words. It sets us both mounting and singing. And it's interesting in the New Testament, the New Testament likes Psalms. What do you mean? Out of the 219 quotes from the Old Testament and the New Testament, 116 of them are from the book of Psalms. Jesus loved the Psalms. The apostles loved the Psalms. And it's primarily 
Hebraic poetry. Now, I'm not going to get too technical with this, but if, for those of you that are interested, there's three kinds of parallelism in the Psalms. There's synonymous, antithetic, and synthetic parallelism. This is not something that's going to be on the test when you leave today, so don't worry about this. But what's a synonymous parallelism? It basically means this. The second line restates the first. You know what I mean? Like Psalm 15 is like this. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Lord, who may dwell in your holy hill? Saying the same thing, but, you know, it's parallel. Does that make sense? Like antithetic, what does that mean? The lines are in contrast to each other. Psalm 37, evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they're going to inherit the earth. You see that? Like we don't, we're not speaking poetry, but this culture would have understood this. Like, oh, I see what he's saying. The synthetic parallelism, successive lines expanding upon the meaning. Oh, he's revealing more and more and more. Psalm 19 is like this. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. It's building. It's building. It's building. Every time you study a book in Scripture, you need to give attention to the genre. What kind of book is this? Because if you don't do that, you'll create bad theology. I'll never forget being in a philosophy of religion class in my first semester at Stetson University as a pre-law major. And my philosophy of religion teacher, it was the year that Stetson moved. It was the first private school in the state of Florida. So it was Christian, as all private schools once were. And it was the year, the year 2000, that they decided to identify now as secular, not Christian. But many of the curriculum and courses still had a lot of residual, a lot of Christian things going on. But they were taught from an entirely different perspective. And so I'll never forget my philosophy of religion class. When the professor found out that I was a Christian, much less a pastor's kid, I was the, the, the person to point to on everything that was going on in Christianity that he disagreed with. And he would build thoughts from the book of Job. See, God didn't create everything. It says right here in Job. Well, if you know the context and the genre, the people that are speaking are idiots. These people are Job's friends, and they're saying bad stuff. So don't take that verse and make a doctrine out of it. But if you don't know context, and you don't know genre, you end up thinking and believing wrong things from the Bible. Does that make sense? Like, you can't make the Bible say whatever you want. You can't, because it does say one thing. But you can twist it out of ignorance. You can I don't want you to be like that. I want, I want you to look, man, I, I can stand on this. Uh, yeah, you, you're wrong. You know, in grace and humility, you can correct. And Anyway, I won't go too far into that, but let's just finish up some of this background stuff. There's a number of different authors. David wrote 73 of these psalms. Asaph, Solomon, the sons of Korah, Ethan, and even Moses are attributed with writing some of these psalms. And the last thing I'll say just by background, let me just say this. I found it so interesting. When I used to read the Psalms the first couple of times, I was like, man, what is this? Is this like the poet, like, like I mean, I don't want to be too graphic here, but it's just like he threw up and put all these things together. Like, it seems so random. Psalms. And then I learned there's a rhythm to it. There's a rhythm to it. There's actually five divisions in the book of Psalms. J. Vernon McGee. Anyone ever heard of J. Vernon McGee? Oh, don't you love that accent? I wish I had that. But listen to what he says. The book of Psalms is not arranged in a haphazard sort of way. Some folks seem to think that the Psalms were dropped into a tub, shaken up, and then put together with no arrangement. But there's five sections, and here's the five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They exemplify in poetry the truths that are taught in, in those five books. Psalm 1 through 41 is seen in the state of blessedness, fall, and recovery. Genesis. Psalms 42 through 72 focus on the ruin and redemption with Israel in view. Exodus. Psalm 73 through 89, darkness and dawn. The Psalms focus on the Levitical section in Psalm 73 through 89. Psalm 90 through 106 is the numbers section focusing on peril and protection. And Psalm 107 through Psalm 150, Deuteronomy perfection and praise of the word of God. Now, if you remember all that on your way out, um, Lucas is going to buy you breakfast, okay? No, no, no. <laughs> like, 
But we say, why do I need to know all that? You won't remember all that, but this is what you need to know. Everything that God does is done in decency and in order. And the book known as Psalms is much like the rest of the 66 that construct this, this book. It's shallow enough for a child to wade in and find the beauty of the gospel. And it's deep enough for the best and most brilliant minds to be confounded by, to always be discovering anew. This book is wonderful. You know why? Because it's EQ to your IQ. If your heart is open. If your heart is open. I don't care who you are. If you've never heard the name of Jesus or you grew up teething on the back of a pew, there's more to learn in God's word for you. And the more you learn to live, not just learn to know, but the more you learn to live, the more God will give to you. That's the way it works. You know much, as much about this as you want. That's what one of my professors said. Because this is not intellectually discerned, but spiritually discerned. And lifestyle is the evidence of faith. Learn this to live it. Don't learn this to know it. Learn it to live it. Now, now that we're done with that sermon, and we've got about 20 minutes left, let's look at Psalm 5. I'm going to ask you to stand because I would like to read Psalm 5. Now, I know this may seem peculiar to you, but I would like to read it from the King James Version. Randy's like, I can't believe this. I went out and bought a new living, you know, whatever, and like, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. But there's a reason for this. This was the Bible that I first bought at age 19 when I said, okay, I'm going to learn this. And from age 19 to about the age of 24, this was my Bible with many notes and pages and glue and things to keep it together. But the lyrics that are written on this handout are written with the King James Version in mind. So to pair these together, oh, that's why it's written that way. I wanted to read it to you how it was read to me when it first impacted me. I brought a new living, don't worry. If we need to explain it better, I got both. But like, let me read this. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct my prayer unto thee and look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak, leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. Verse 11 and 12. This is where he ends with the right perspective. But let all those who put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them shout for joy because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, but thou compass him as with a shield. Okay, you may be seated. You know, our family attempts, tries, does the best that we can, focuses on, has a schedule, has a rhythm to do devotions weekly, daily and weekly, but daily. A great tool for us recently has been that Daily in the Word program where we watch that little devotion, and then I just simply ask my kids this simple question. What'd you hear? That's it. 
And if it's like something bad, like, well, Jesus isn't God. Nope, that's not what that said. You know, like, let me correct that. Um, and then we pray. And that's our devotion every day. It's pretty simple. But I remember when this guy, let me show you a picture of Liam. Uliam Lee Neal Spencer. Well, maybe I'll show you a picture if Mo's still back there, if Zach's still back there. There he is. There's Liam. This is his spring school picture. Look at that red hair. It comes with an attitude, I'll tell you that much. Little Liam. When Liam was three, he's five now, I remember asking him in a morning devotion when we were talking about the time to pray. These are the two things I say to my kids when it's time to pray. Super simple, starts with a T. Is there anything you want to talk to God about, Liam? Or anything you want to thank him for? Talk and thank, talk and thank, talk and, this is how we pray. We thank God and we talk to God. And this is what Liam said when I asked him, Liam, is there anything you want to thank God for or talk to him about? And this is what Liam said. I want to give God a hug. And I thought, wow, you're way more insightful than I. I need alliteration. <laughs> but you hit the essence of prayer. You hit it. Intimacy with God. Connection with God. That's face to face. Not back to back where you're angry at God. Not shoulder to shoulder. I work for God. But face to face. I want to give God a hug, he said. Now he's three. The next minute he probably pulled his sister's hair out. But in that moment, it was like, that's it. It's connection. It's intimacy. It's touch. It's presence. That's what we're made for. In Psalm chapter 5, we see this desire. Listen to me, God. Hearken to my voice. I'm here in the morning. These are all these people around me. But Lord, I'm going to keep my focus on you. That's Psalm 5. We see a rhythm of communication with God in Psalm chapter 5. And let me give you, I, can't, I know you won't believe this, but three Ps of how to remember this psalm. Prayer perspective, and praise. Prayer. In verses 1 through 2, I know this may seem crazy to you, but he prays to God. Who does he pray to? Pop quiz, who does he pray to? Starts with a G, ends with a D, and rhymes with God. He prays to? You got it. You got it. He looks to who? God. But what is God? God is the master passion of your life. That is what God is. And for many of us, it's ourselves. We love to talk about ourselves, read about ourselves in Self Magazine, work on ourselves at a gym, feed ourselves at a restaurant. Self is king. For many of us, if we're honest, we're moralistic deists. We believe there's a God. We believe there's morals. But the master passion of my life, through comfort, is self. And my mechanisms to serve self may be salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, or sport. But this is what he says. I look to God. This may seem ever so elementary, my friends, but many of us, I think, could do with a little bit of evaluation. What is the master passion of my life? Is it my marriage? Is it my portfolio? Is it, I want those masks to end and don't require a shot so I can travel again. Like, what is the master passion? What do you wake up thinking about? What do you go to sleep releasing from your thoughts? I'm trying to tell you this. If it's not God, it's something less. It's something cheap. It's an imitator. Did any of you from the 90s like to buy Folkleys? Remember those? No, you wanted to buy Oakleys. Remember that? Like, oh, I got some Folkleys for you. Nobody wants that. You want the real thing. That's why Folkleys exist, right? So let me just tell you, you want the master passion of your life to be the one who's beat death, the one who can actually give you joy, peace, kindness, goodness, self-control, and a lifestyle, Romans 12, 2, that is good, pleasing, and perfect. That's what you want. 
It's what you've been fashioned for. And let me just say this, and my dad can correct this because he's been around a lot longer, so I, I'm not, I think this is right. You're designed for that. It's yours. Go for it. How? Die to yourself. Recognize that you're a sinner. Realize that Jesus is a Savior. Repent of your sin and receive the gift of forgiveness by grace and new life. That's where it starts. The master passion of your life must be, should be, can be the one who gives you life. Why settle for anything else? To settle for anything else is to settle for something or someone less. This may seem elementary, but David, he speaks to God. He doesn't let CNN or Fox News speak to him before he speaks to God. Does that make sense? He doesn't let Instagram or Facebook or the bank balance or the day's schedule speak to him before he speaks to God. He starts his day the right way. If you don't start your day vertically, and then it's time to get horizontal, horizontal ain't going to make no sense. It's going to mess you up. It's going to leave you fruitless, frazzled, frustrated, and freaked out, you know? But if you start it vertically, perspective. Perspective. He comes to God in verses 1 and 2. And then in verse 3, when does he pray? It starts with an M, it ends with a G, and it rhymes with Gorning. When does he pray? He prays in the morning. Warren Wearsby said, like our Lord Jesus, referencing Mark chapter 1, David kept this appointment morning by morning. This is a journal from March 16th, 2006. Let me read to you the person that was speaking when I wrote these notes down. The longer I've walked with the Lord, the more important the Psalms have become. When the psalmist speaks of the one who, to, who is to destroy, remember that? We read that, break them, kill them, do them. As believers, you need to recognize he's talking about the flesh or the world in your own life. See it with that perspective. And that war is within all of us. All of the Psalms become personal when I realize that my true enemy is the enemy. It's the flesh. And I pray you'd break the teeth out of his mouth. And it becomes ever so personal because the world, the flesh, and the devil come for us all. We need to learn how to fight. He says, the greater than David was never accused of being busy. I like that. Some say the man in demand is the man in command. In our society, bus busyness is a commodity of the successful. This creeps into ministry, he said. But people never felt like they were bothering Jesus. He moved with tranquility and peace. Why? Why was Jesus' life lived so serenely? He speaks of Mark chapter 1, verse 32 through 35, which you can reference later, but Jesus in that time of ministry when it was busy found a quiet place with a quiet heart for a quiet time long before the sun arose. And Jesus was after the Father's will and the Father's heart. Jesus had no agenda other than to seek the Father and the things that please him, his will, his heart, in his time. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 45, let me read it to you. It says, the sovereign Lord has given me his words of wisdom so that I may know how to comfort the weary. Listen to this phrase, morning by morning, he awakens me and opens my understanding to his will. Morning by morning. Jesus got his instructions for the day before the day began. If I don't start my day early, I am one who is frizzled, frazzled, fried. But the Lord speaks to us very individually, morning by morning. When I get my instructions in the morning for the day, I too have the opportunity to move more serenely through my day. The one who leads a simple life is the one who's already made the decision. Let 
There's more that's said that I won't read at this time. But I love this last thing that he said. For the, Christ, for the people of Israel, manna came in the morning. Now some people may say, Neil, I know what you're saying. But I need to get out of bed and read the Bible and pray. Well, I'm a night person. I'm an afternoon person. God bless you. I know in Psalm 50, verses 4 through 5, he says, morning by morning, he awakens me. I know in Psalm 5, he talks about getting up early before the day starts. I know in Mark chapter 1, he gets up early. So what are you saying? That if I'm not a legalistically morning person, I'm going to hell? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you don't start your day with the right perspective, you may end up being more reactionary than responsive. That's all I'm saying. And some people may go, well, I don't believe that. Well, God bless you. We can live our lives differently. I've just got some Bible and some thoughts and some things that, you know, I feel like it's better to get dressed before I walk out the door. Anyone else agree? Why not orient your mind? If you say, I need five minutes, then take five minutes. If you're like Martin Luther and says, I've got so much to do today, I must spend three hours in prayer, then God bless you. But at least do something. Like your drive-in, turn the right radio station on. Wherever you are, start there. It's your race. Run your race. Forget about the person next to you. If they get up at whatever time, who cares? I'm just saying this. If Jesus rose from the dead, it's okay to get out of bed one or two minutes earlier to at least start your day in prayer and to hear the word. And we'll even give you a tool. At 6 a.m., we'll send you an email with a two-minute video to help you. And if you're not up by 6 and you get like a normal lifestyle of work, well, then it's still there at 7, still there at 8, still there at 9, still there at 10, still there at 11, but at least by 6. In our situation, we just not that smart. We keep having babies. And so we had one baby wake up at, I think it was 4.30. Well, we're up. Yeah, that's what's going on. I haven't slept in 12 years is what it feels like. <laughs> anyway. When does he pray? He prays in the morning. But listen to the kind of prayer. I won't go into this for the sake of your time and the sake of your seat, but it's directed prayer. Man, there's so much I could say right here, but this mindset is structured. It's focused. It's not a shotgun prayer. It's a rifle prayer. That's why this, for me, was so helpful. How do I focus in prayer? Because you know what I'm like? Well, what's going on in the Instagram world? Or I say one prayer, go, oh, that reminds me. I need to schedule this appointment. I am so distracted. I need to focus. So let me see if I can spend two minutes in praise. Oh, okay, I got to focus now. And you know, what, you know what thinking clearly is? It's called writing. That's all thinking clearly is, is writing it out. Okay, I'm going to write this down for two minutes. God, you're good. There's praise. God, you're kind. Okay. Uh, how many more minutes do I got? <laughs> you know, but it teaches you. I need to praise God. Okay, Thanksgiving. Well, two minutes or, or 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Start somewhere, five seconds. It's just a tool. It's not the way to pray. It's a way to say, Lord, what if I spent time in praise and thanksgiving? And then I come to that water basin where they would wash their hands. And I focus on the water of the word. Or I come to that place where the sacrifice was given. And I remember that you were sacrificed for me. Or I come to that place where they presented that animal and I confess before you. Tabernacle prayer. Interesting tool. Been ever helpful to me. But see, here's the deal. There's a prayer in Psalm chapter 5. He prays to God. He prays in the morning. Where does he pray? There in verse 7, he says the temple. Can I ask you a question? Pop quiz. Where is the temple of God today? It, it starts with Y, ends with you, and it rhymes with Mu. You. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean, that you have to come here to pray? You can. You definitely can. You can also pray in the woods. You can also pray on the beach. You can also pray with your spouse. You can also pray at the dinner time. You know what? You can actually pray at work. Did you know that? Wherever you are, you're in the presence of God. What does he pray? Verses 8 through 10, 
Verse 8, he says, God, lead me. That's basically what he says. But look, you know what he says in verse 10? God, get him. That's what he says. Like in verse 10, it's known as an imprecatory psalm where the writers seem to kind of speak a lot about God's wrath. But several factors must be considered. Because if you read these psalms without the right perspective, you're like, man, God's a bully. That's what, that's what this feels like. One author wrote this. I thought this was great. Referencing 1 John 4 and 1 John 1, he said, God is love and God is light. And in his holiness, he must deal with sin. Ever since the fall of man in Genesis 3, there has been a battle going on in the world between truth and lies, justice and injustice, right and wrong, and we cannot be neutral in this battle. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Reflections on the Psalms, says, if the Jews cursed more bitterly than the pagans, this was, I think, at least in part because they took right and wrong so seriously. For if we look at their railings, we find they are usually angry, not simply because these things have been done to them, but because these things are manifestly wrong, are hateful to God, as well as to the victim. Perhaps our problem today is what C.S. Lewis pointed out. We don't hate sin enough to get upset at the wickedness and godliness around us. But we're bombarded as, as we are by so much media of evil and violence. We've just become accustomed to it. Where we just say, yeah, well, boys will be boys. The world will be the world. Do we have a distaste? Like Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, an abhorrence for evil. Or is it something that we say, it's just where we are now? Or do we pray, God, break down that stronghold. God, destroy that initiative to warp children's minds. Is there anything wrong with that? That kind of prayer. I say no. I say do it. I say pray that God would shine his light and that the enemy's attempts would fail. Do you see what I'm saying here? This isn't that God is again, oh, break them. They're not with us. They're again. Let's go get them. No, it's the evil that he says, this needs to be destroyed. This needs to be uprooted. This needs to be done away with. Lord, you do it. Lord, you do it. Lord, you do it. And this is the one who fights well. What? Who doesn't say, come on, demons. Come on, Satan. I'm coming against you. No, 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 no. They say, may the Lord deal with you. I'm going to put my, 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 my agenda, my way to fight on the shoulders of our champion, Jesus. May the Lord deal with that. This is how he prays. As we wrap this up, let me share two last simple things. There's a prayer to God in the temple in the morning, and he's praying for God's justice to be done. That's what he's praying about in Psalm chapter 5. The perspective, verses 4 through 6, in verse 9, you know what he's saying? God has judged. Listen to me. Let me see your eyes. If you're a Christian, you need to know this. It's finished. It's done. He doesn't hold your habits, hang-ups, and issues against you. Jesus said on the cross, to Telestai, the payment is paid in full. Your sin is dealt with. God has judged the sin. And also, we see in this psalm, God is going to judge. See, God has dealt with, through his son Jesus, the penalty of our sin and the power that sin has in our lives. And one day, one day, the presence of sin will be eradicated. But it is not today. Everything on this side of eternity is impacted by the presence of sin. Everything. There is no safe place. Everything. Everything. You must have this perspective. I'm free. I'm forgiven. I'm part of a family. I have a future. There should be joy. That's what he says here in Psalm 5, joy. But I also am not an idiot. I recognize this place has got some problems. If I just trust the Lord and walk on 98 and say, well, the Lord will protect me. Yeah, he will in heaven. Like, I mean, you can't do stupid stuff. Like we live in a world of broken, okay, you know that. The perspective. And then lastly, 
verse 11 through 12, we see a praise. Do you see 11 through 12 where he says, let those that put their trust in you be somber, be bummed, be sad. No. What does it say? It starts with an R, ends with an E, and it rhymes with me, me yoice. Rejoice. We could do with a few more rejoicing believers. Why? Because my trust is in you. Not my trust fund is growing. My trust is in you. That's why I rejoice. He says, let them shout for joy. You may come to church and say, well, I'm just not that kind of guy. You know, I'm a, I'm a man that hunts, fishes, and does all this stuff. I would never sing in church. I would just say, you know what, you're just, you're lame. That's what I would say. You know why? Because it says it right here. You don't sing because you want to. You don't sing because you're good at it. You sing because you're obedient. That's why you sing. Because God tells you to do it. And unless you get that trait down as a disciple, how could you be a disciple? It's about following Jesus obediently. Not to get favor. We have favor. But obedience opens up the door for you to experience his presence. Men, please, servant lead. The world needs more servant leader men who don't care about anyone's opinion other than one person, maybe two, him and their spouse. Now, they live in respect for others. But many men are held captive by a lack of respect from others. You ever heard of road rage? That's what that is. You ever come across a man that goes, he doesn't respect me, yet now he owns you? Because look at what you're acting like, a fool. Because someone showed you disrespect. Man, you're bought so cheaply. One guy shows you disrespect and you've gone off the hinges. Are you really that weak? Who cares if they don't respect you? If he doesn't respect me and she doesn't respect me, that matters. Everyone else? Everyone comes into your life for a reason, but it is only for a season. It does not matter. It does not impact me. I care what he thinks. I care what she thinks, because they know me. Everyone else is always showing you what they want you to see. But you can't hide from God. You can't hide from your spouse. Their opinions matter the most. Don't be held captive by the opinions of others. People are nuts. I mean, why do we care what they think? It's going to change. People will deify you until they demonize you. It's the way we go with everything. Or they'll demonize you until they can deify you. But you're always somewhere in the middle. Praise. He says, shout to the Lord in joy because of his character, because of his promises, because of his graciousness. I want you to live free, to live free. Psalm chapter 5 is one who is free. Is he without struggle? Absolutely not. <laughs> He's going through it. Lord, it's all around me. <laughs> but my perspective, my perspective. Now, if you hear this morning these kind of mindsets, if you're not up early, you're not a Christian. Like, no. Some people will hear that. I'll get an email or a tweet or a you know, passing aggressive comment about, oh, I'm a night person. Okay, I don't really... I'm just telling you what this guy said. I'm telling you that it's okay to put deodorant on before you go outside. You know what I'm saying physically, spiritually? Like, it's okay to prepare for your day in the Word, in worship, in your witness. And I just don't know how, you don't do that in anything else in life. Like, you don't become an anesthesiologist by just saying, well, I want to be one, so I'm going to start doing it. Well, you got to prepare and then get trained and then go out and do. And so if you want to live your day right, maybe prepare spiritually. However much time, that's between you and the Lord. But at the very least, Lord, thank you for this morning. All right, cool. You can do that. Like, you could do that. Lord, thank you for this morning. Six words. You could do that. Started your, pr your perspective rightly. Now, if you want to spend more time in the Bible later, awesome. But I'm just encouraging you. Just encouraging you. Make it all only and always about Jesus. 
it's not just the right thing to do. It's the smartest thing to do. Either live for one who's conquered sin, death, and the grave and says, I've got all authority in heaven and earth, or go live for something less. Those are your options. I'm just, I just, I'm not that smart. That's, that's the logical thing. Well, this is the LeBron of the universe. I'm going with him, you know, like even though he got knocked out in the first round. But you see what I'm saying? Whoever the new LeBron is, but you may not get that analogy, but whoever the guy is, you know, I'm following that guy. That guy's on my team. Jesus is that guy, like <laughs> over everything. I just want to be on his team. Wherever he puts me, I'm fine with that, but I'm on the team. That's what I want. How do we, where do we go from this? Well, for me, I'm a processor. I'm a thinker. I like to like, I don't know what to do, so let me write it down, you know? So that's why I, 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 I put these words down, because it so impacted me, where I said, Lord, teach me to wait, teach me to seek, teach me to wait, teach me to have a heart like yours. If that helps put you to sleep, God bless you. But the second thing is this. I want to ask us in closing to pray over something. See, teaching and preaching that doesn't lead to an effective lifestyle of service is a waste of time. Like if we don't learn to live, then let's go do something else. I don't, I don't want to just like give sermons and like, I want, I want to see people experience new life in Jesus. 